Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 1. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are here celebrating the supreme manifestation of your love through our Savior, Jesus Christ. May your Spirit move our hearts and allow us to receive the blessing coming through it. In Jesus' name, amen. My mother-in-law is a very virtuous and devout Christian lady. I'm impressed how she tried to have her children impregnated with the Bible. I didn't have that in my family. She would teach her children Bible, entire Bible passages, Psalms, entire Psalms, and other sections from the Bible. She would have a reward system for that many Bible verses, you will get that kind of a prize. And for that many Bible verses, and these were tens and hundreds of Bible verses. I was wondering why she would do that. And I remembered that I read it somewhere from Ellen G. White, and I want to quote it to see how she speaks about it, Desire of Ages, page 83, this is what she says, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Please notice, this is not a void meditation. She says, a thoughtful hour every day, each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. One of the passages, pretty long section of the Bible, that uh, my wife and... Uh, her younger brother would learn by heart was the passion narrative in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 26 and 27. And Anda says that um, when they would learn those passages, they had a very simple method, you read through it until you know it by heart. I don't know if you have any other method of memorization. But that's how you kind of do it. You read it until you know it. 
but she says sometimes when sh they would go through this passion narrative about how Jesus Christ was betrayed, how she was taken into custody, how she was then uh, made fun of, she was abused. They did all kind of horrible things to her, and then in the end, they crucified her. She says, by the time the passage was read through, they had their eyes wet. Because they were impressed. They were touched. They were moved by what they were reading. I don't want to debate whether this is the most appropriate passage for children to learn by heart. I think it depends on age as well. Because seeing and imagining the cruelty of people can be really a traumatic experience for a child. But I'm pretty sure from a certain age up, each one of us would benefit from reading through the life of Jesus Christ with a special focus on this final part. Ellen White says, on the last scenes. This is how she continues. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially those closing ones. Why those closing ones? This is how she continues. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him, get that one, our confidence in him will be more constant. Because yes, we trust him now and we don't trust him in a minute from now. Our confidence in Him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened. And we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. Believe me, there is something about reading through and thoughtfully meditating on the final scenes of Jesus' earthly life. Jesus has been preparing his disciples for these moments. He knew it was not going to be easy for them. And there are four announcements. In the Gospel of Matthew, four times Jesus announces that he will die. He will be killed. He makes his disciples know what is going to happen. The first announcement in the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew 17, 16, verse 21. This is what he says. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And if you read on, you will see that the disciples were disturbed. They wanted to ask some questions, but they were afraid to even ask questions about this. Then the next announcement is chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, remember the previous announcement said that they were going to Jerusalem. They were going to the place of the execution. But they are still there in Galilee. In chapter 17, they are still there in Galilee. And it says, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed. Please notice how with every announcement, something new is disclosed about it. Jesus is prepping them up. Jesus wants them to understand what is going to happen. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed. This is new. 
This was not mentioned in the previous announcement. In the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. It was heartbreaking for them to hear what Jesus was announcing. But then there's a third announcement in Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Behold, says Jesus, we are going up to Jerusalem. They are already on the way to Jerusalem. Because Jesus takes the step that is necessary. He moves toward the moment of the supreme sacrifice. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed. We have known about this now. To, be, to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death, verse 19, and deliver him to the Gentiles. This is new. We didn't know about this up to this point. Deliver to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to, and this is new again, crucify. And the third day he will rise again. But then you reach the fourth announcement. And please see how this fourth announcement presents the moment of the supreme sacrifice. Chapter 26, verse 2. You know, Jesus says to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. What Jesus says here, hey guys, it's two days away. In, in two days, what I have been announcing to you is going to happen. Only two days. We are two days apart of the event. And please notice that Jesus reveals more and more about what is going to happen. And as he reveals new and new elements of his sacrifice, he makes steps. He goes in that direction steadily. Nothing, nobody can stop him. He goes toward the sacrifice. When is the sacrifice going to happen? What is the event? Passover. Did you all get that moment? We are two days away from Passover. Jesus, the sacrifice, the executed, knows when it will happen. Let's see what the executioners do. Verse 3, then the chief priests the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas to do what? Verse 4. What? And plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. I was very curious to see what that trickery really means. And uh, I found all kind of translations. One of uh, those translations uses uh, a word that was pretty new to me, stealth. Do you know what stealth is? It's an old word, it's probably still used. It was new to me, so I, I tried to capture the picture, what it means. I, I think it comes from steal, right? To steal, stealth. What is that? And one of the descriptions I found about the meaning of the word, and it's the exact meaning of the Greek word that is translated by trickery here, is uh, like a hungry cat that is waiting for something to steal and run away. So they were plotting, they were putting their heads together there at the palace of Caiaphas, how to catch Jesus, how to take him in custody in a way that will not disturb the people. Snatch him somehow, abduct him somehow, or just kidnap him, take him out and disappear with him. 
That was the plan. The question is, when were they planning to do that? When? They said, not during the feast. When did Jesus say he was going to die, to be killed? <laughs> did, you, did you see the difference? So the, so the sacrifice tells them, the victim says, hey, I will be killed on the day of the feast. Or during the feast. The executioners get together and they plan and they say, no, 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 no. Not on the day of the feast, not on Passover. Why? Lest an uproar will happen because, yes, the city was full of people. Many of the, the Galileans were there, and Jesus was pretty famous in Galilee. It's very hard to use your trickery method to snatch him away, to just rapture him and hide him somewhere and, and kill him when he's surrounded by people. So not now. Sometime later. So now the question is, the executed tells you the date of his execution. The executioners tell you the date of the execution. Who is right? When was Jesus executed? When the executioners wanted to execute him? Or when he told his disciples he would be executed? So then the question is, what was Jesus actually? Was he a victim or something else? Well, he was not a victim. Had he been a victim, he would not have known exactly the time of his execution. If somebody is a victim, the time of the execution is not known by the victim. It's known by the executionists executioners. But it seems that the executioners made a miscalculation. They wanted to kill him later and take this one. How can that happen? You want to kill him later and yet you killed him earlier. Exactly when he said it would happen. Was he a victim? Uh -uh. He was a sacrifice. There's a huge difference there. But there's another element. Have you noticed the difference between the method of death revealed by the executed and the method of death prepared by the executioners? Was Jesus a victim? No, he wasn't. Had he been a, a victim, he wouldn't have known the exact method of his execution. Because these people are planning to snatch him and hide him. Is that the method? What they did not know, but the executed did know, there was one more element in the puzzle. And his name was Judas. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. They did not have to do their trickery and snatch him away. Because there was an insider guy that knew every move of the master. And he delivered him to them. Again, they made a miscalculation. The executed knew it better than the executioners. That's a huge difference. Because if you have a victim, you have somebody that is powerless, that cannot do anything against it. When you have a sacrifice, you have somebody that is powerful, indeed somebody that is almighty, and yet he doesn't do anything against it. Not only that, when you look at what Jesus did, how he gave himself, 
you realize they could not have killed him unless he allowed himself to be killed. And that's sacrifice. Now, does that excuse the fact that they killed him? No. <laughs> because what Jesus knew and what was the divine plan did not interfere in the sense of canceling out the decision of Judas or of the priests or even of the Gentiles involved. These are two different plans. But one interesting aspect can be seen. The plot of evil will make miscalculations in front of the divine, steady unfolding of God's plans. And that's exactly what we can see here in the gospel. They miscalculate because the human beings that are involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the whole process leading up to it, and the divisive plan behind it, they cannot know their own hearts. Because when Judas appeared and he made an offer, they forgot about their plans. And they immediately went with the plan that was brought together, divinely orchestrated by God. Because they said, okay, now is the moment. Let's seize it. Let's eliminate him. Yes, the victim is powerless. The sacrifice is powerful. He is indeed all powerful. And that is precisely the power of love. The power of love is I could stop this. I could avoid this. I could run away from this. I could make their plans turn against them. And yet, love that gives himself goes and allows it to happen. And even unmasks the miscalculations of evil. That's the sacrifice. Was the sacrifice real? Of course, it was real. Was the sacrifice God planned? Of course, it was God planned. Could it have played out differently? Of course, if those people made a different decision. It played out the way it played out because there was a divine plan of self-giving. And there were people that in spite of their evil thinking and plans were used in the divine plan, not against their will, but with the collaboration of their own decision. Now, I know this is very hard to get. It may seem like a very fine line, but this is the plan of salvation in which God is above, above everything, but at the same time works with the human element. So, Victim or sacrifice? It's a sacrifice, self-giving, that allows in front of the whole universe to seem, to look like it's a victim. But then on the day of resurrection, you clearly can see if it's a victim or it's a sacrifice. Because had it been a victim, you would have never had the tomb crack open up and let the victim go free. But that's what happened and that's what we celebrate today. Amen? Amen.